I'd just first of all like to thank the organisers of the conference for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, all I'm planning to do today is to give an overview of three studies that have emerged from our lab um, examining the effects of foot structure, sensory feedback and shoe cushioning on various biomechanical risk factors for knee or in injuries in running. So just before I get started on the nitty gritty of the studies though, um, just want to, to be upfront about the fact that some of the data from two of the studies um, emerged from a PhD which was jointly funded by Northumbria University and Vivo Barefoot. But just to say that Vivo Barefoot had no input to the design, the analysis or the interpretation of any of the data and there is no existing or ongoing financial relationship between the university, myself or Vivo Barefoot. Okay, so just to state the problem that motivated these studies, uh, knee, in, knee injuries in running are quite prevalent. Uh, around 42% of all running injuries in, annually are to the knee and 29% of those are classified as patellofemoral um, pain syndrome. Now what we know already from the existing literature is that there are certain biomechanical risk factors for patellofemoral pain syndrome and some of those include Excessive frontal plane ankle and knee movement. So frontal plane is, if you can imagine yourself looking at the runner from the front, the knee and the ankle moving side to side is what we mean by frontal plane movement. So excessive frontal plane movement at the knee and the ankle is one of the risk factors for um, patellofemoral pain. High peak vertical loading rates. So the loading rate at impact is also a known risk factor for patellofemoral pain, as is high peak knee flexion moments. So or a moment is just a load at the knee. So the highest load that you experience in flexion uh, during the running cycle. So those are three of the known uh, risk factors for uh, running related knee joint pain. Now, one of the underpinning philosophies that, um, <clears throat> that sort of formed the basis for this work was that there might be, um, you know, a, a natural solution or maybe mother nature has come up with a, a solution to some of the problems of locomoting in a biped wanting to move in a, in a forwards direction and somebody has said that mother nature is an engineer in that the natural selection appears to, to produce the simplest solutions to, to functional problems but the solution arisen through natural selection might not be the ideal because we have to bear in mind that natural selection has to work with the material that it's got to work with so obviously humans are evolved from primates and if we look at our primate ancestors, and we'll look particularly at the structure of their foot and ankle, uh, we'll see that the foot and ankle of the primate was originally evolved for um, gripping round, uh, round trunks of trees. So the, um, particularly the subtalar joint and the axis of it and the architecture of that joint is perfectly um, evolved for allowing the ankle to wrap around or the foot to wrap around a tree trunk to facilitate climbing. And the, foot, the structure of the foot itself looks more like a hand for that gripping function. Humans have inherited that same subtalar joint axis. Now you can see from the red line on the graph, the subtalar joint axis is oblique to the intended direction of travel for walking and running. So the green line is the axis of leverage, that's the direction we'd like to be traveling in for running and walking. But uh, the, the red line, the axis of the subtalar joint is oblique to that. Now that means that when we load the foot, the foot has a tendency because of the architecture of the ankle joint to roll inwards. Right, the so-called pronation type movement. Now that would be wasted energy. Lateral movement when you're trying to move forwards would be wasted energy. So natural selection solution was to take the first metatarsal and the great toe to make it thicker, longer and stronger in an attempt to provide leverage to control that obligatory inward roll that occurs because of the structure of the subtalar joint. So in one of the first studies that we, that we had out of the lab, we hypothesized that that position of the big toe, which is one of the structural differences between our primate ancestors and us, um, might perform a kind of uh, anchor or rudder type role in stabilizing the base of support to make it easier to pass the body weight in a forward direction over the foot. So counteracting that natural inward roll that occurs at the subtalar joint. So this was our hypothesis. We hypothesized that there would be a link or an association between the angle of that great toe and the first metatarsal, the alignment of it, and the, move, the subsequent movement of the foot and the ankle during loading at running, and also the upstream movement of the knee joint in the frontal plane, that sideways movement of the knee joint. 
So in this study, we mark head up runners. Um, we used a 3D motion capture system, uh, which converts, you might have seen these on, on science programs, you know, they convert um, the runner into a, a, a sort of skeleton depicted on the diagrams on the bottom right there. We quantified the angle of the great toe in relation to the first metatarsal by taking a photograph of the foot from above and working out the angle uh, around various uh, anatomical landmarks. And we captured the 3D motion capture, we worked out um, the peak pronation angle of the foot and the ankle and the lateral joint excursion of the knee during, uh, during the running cycle. Now the results from this, the graph on the, uh, so figure one over there is showing the, the relationship between the angle of the great toe, the valgus angle we call it, so the, the valgus angle is the toe moving in towards the lesser toes, the great toe moving in towards the lesser toes. And we found that the relationship between that and peak pronation um, angle at the, uh, at the angle on the joint, uh, the foot. So we can see there's a negative association between those two variables. So as your great toe becomes progressively more squashed in towards the lesser toes, so the pronation angle, the peak pronation angle during the running stride is greater. So there's a bit more of a roll in the more that your toe is angled in. And in figure two, if we look upstream at the knee joint, we found a positive association between the great toe valgus angle and the joint excursion at the knee. So that lateral side to side movement of the knee was greater the more the toe was squashed in towards the other toes. So the kind of take home message from this particular study was that the great toe appears to be important for stabilizing the foot and the ankle and subsequently also the knee joint during running. And as I said, we know that that lateral knee joint excursion is one of the risk factors for patellofemoral pain. Okay, the second study I wanted to talk about was exploring the role of sensory feedback in impact moderation. So the second risk factor um, I talked about on the, on the earlier on in the presentation was impact loading rates and how they appear to be associated with patello, fellow, sorry, patellofemoral pain. Now, the idea for this one came from some earlier work by Steve Robbins and his what he called innate behavioral impact moderation hypothesis. Or to, to simplify things, um, if you, you have a greater sense of impact, you take impact avoiding behavior to not feel that horrible sense of impact. All right? So that's more of the sort of that hypothesis in, in a bit of a sort of simpler terms. So what we did in this one is we, uh, we hypothesized that by increasing plantar sensory feedback, so the sensation of impact and loading through the sole of the foot, we might be able to adjust or alter gait and alter the loading rate or how gently people were landing um, during running. So we used overground running on an indoor track. Uh, we had force plates embedded in the track. We filmed the runners going through the force plates from the side to work out various characteristics of the running gait. And we had runners perform the same running speed, self-selected running speed, under two different conditions. One was with what we call a minimal shoe, so it fits the characteristics and definition of a minimal shoe, essentially an old school Army and Navy plimsoll uh, in its standard form. And then we had the runners perform this uh, task again with the same shoe, but with an insert of a textured insole. Now the texture, as you can see, is a, a kind of like blown up version of the textured insole from the side, um, had ridges running um, perpendicular to the axis of travel. Right? And it was, it was quite an aggressive texture because we wanted to try and manipulate um, plantar sensory feedback and then see what the effect of that would be. And the runners performed a few trials at their self-selected speed, and we took the average of the few trials, and the order in which they performed these trials with the insole and without the insole was counterbalanced and randomized so that there was no kind of order effect going on or a learning effect with a textured insole. Now the results from this were quite interesting. We found on average, there was a reduction in the peak loading rate, the impact loading rate between the insole and the no insole condition of 17 body weights per second, around 15% reduction in impact load with the textured insole. Now uh, you can see on the uh, on figure four there, which is uh, taken from the from the paper, we've got the ground reaction force, the vertical ground reaction force traces, which are averaged across all the participants, um, completing those runs with and without the textured insole. And we're looking at the, the, the loading rate, which we calculated is from, it's the change in force over time, over that period from 20 to 80% of the initial impact peak. 
which are denoted by the dotted lines on the graph there. So it's over those slopes, if, if you like, the blue line and the red line, that we're calculating the, um, the rate at which the force increases, right? the, the rate of loading, if you like. Okay, so we've got, a, we've got quite, an interesting, um, quite an interesting result there, quite an interesting sort of substantial reduction, if you like, in the loading rate, just from um, the, uh, the increase in the texture in the, with the textured insole. And we found that that was associated with some interesting changes in the gait pattern as well. So subjective rating of plantar sensation increased unsurprisingly with the insoles. If you wore one, you would really know what I meant. Um, that was associated with a decrease in the contact time and the flight time and the stride length and an increase in the stride rate. So that increase in subjective plantar sensation appears to have subconsciously or consciously adjusted the runner's um, gait characteristics such that they land more gently when running at the same speed. So the take home message from this study was that if we increase plantar sensory feedback, it appears to modify some aspects of running technique and that those alterations in running technique appear to be associated with that decrease in peak vertical loading rate. And again, peak vertical loading rate is one of those risk factors for knee joint injury. Okay, so if we're coming to the final study, the final study that I wanted to talk about was leading on from the previous one where we talked about plantar sensation, how that might modify gait. But instead of using textured insoles this time, um, we essentially manipulated plantar sensation a little bit by using cushioning, different amounts of cushioning uh, on the runner. And we wanted to find out the influence of different kinds of cushioning on overstride and peak knee joint moments, which is another one of the risk factors for, for knee joint, um, telofemoral joint pain. So this one emerged from some previous work showing that um, overstride, uh, which is related to stride length, increases peak braking forces and increases uh, joints at the at loads at the knee joint. And it's also based on previous research showing that stride length or overstride, if you like, is somewhat affected by what you've got on your feet. So it's fairly well established that running barefoot uh, results in shorter stride lengths than running in conventional shoes. And it's also known that running in minimal shoes or barefoot shoes is not exactly the same as running barefoot. There are also some slight biomechanical differences there. Uh, and there hasn't been an awful lot of work looking at maximally cushioned shoes, which would be at the other end of the spectrum from the barefoot. So we kind of hypothesized a sliding scale uh, where barefoot would be at one end with the shortest stride length, uh, the shortest overstride, and therefore the lowest peak knee joint moments. Then at the opposite end of the spectrum, we'd have the maximally cushioned shoe which we hypothesize would lead to the greatest overstride and the greatest peak knee joint moment. And somewhere in the middle, um, you might find the, the sort of minimal shoe. So the methods for this one were similar to uh, one, of the, one of the previous studies. We used 3D motion capture. Um, after a period of, of habituation to the different footwear conditions, because not a lot of the participants were used to running in bare feet or in minimal shoes, or for that matter in maximally cushioned shoes. We had a 30 minute period of habituation, which from a previous study in the, in the series of studies, we had found 15 minutes was enough for somebody to, to stabilize their gait pattern in whichever kind of footwear they were wearing. So we made sure belt and braces run for 30 minutes in uh, whatever condition that they were running in that day. Uh, all the conditions were performed on different days. And then there was a series of runs through our biomechanics lab which has four embedded force plates and a number of cameras to capture um, the runner as they go through and convert that into a 3D avatar. We used a combination of the, knee, of the, ankle, uh, sorry, the angles from the joints and the ground reaction forces from the force plates using a process called inverse dynamics to calculate what the peak um, knee joint loading or moment was during the gait cycle. Okay, so the results of this one, it, it came out, it's, it's not often this happens, but it came out uh, pretty much as we hypothesized. So we found that stride length progressively increased as runners went from the barefoot to the minimal shoe condition to the maximally cushioned shoe. And in that same pattern, knee joint, uh, peak loading at the knee joint also increased from the barefoot to the minimal shoe to the maximally cushioned shoe condition. So the summary that uh, take home message from this one was that the, the, the choice of footwear appears to influence self-selected stride length at a fixed running speed. And that, that stride length appears to influence peak knee joint load, which is, you know, is one of those risk factors for running related knee joint injury. 
Okay, so just to round up the presentation, um, the data that I've presented from the three studies uh, are seeming to suggest that the great toe is an important factor for controlling lateral knee joint movement in running. So it's a stabilizing, uh, stabilizing factor, it appears. That increasing sensory feedback from the bottom of the foot appears to be important for moderating running gait. And that moderation in running gait, that alteration in running gait appears to, uh, to moderate impact load. And that peak knee joint loads are lower in barefoot and in minimal shoes than in maximally cushioned shoes. And those loading rates, the, the peak knee joint loads appear to be related to um, stride length and how stride length is altered by those different types of footwear. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that uh, some of this has been at least a little bit informative.